quiet summer's night in Beverly Hills. A middle-aged couple sat down to watch a video of a favorite James Bond film inside their multi-million dollar mansion. They never saw the end. The gunshots that pierced the hot night air weren't on the film's soundtrack. Just before midnight, Beverly Hills police received an emergency call from the two young sons of the dead couple. I got a call at home. I was in bed. A double homicide, two people were murdered, and that we need to come in for it. On any kind of case, when you get called in the middle of the night or even during the daytime when you got to come back, you, you, you're, you're always running through your mind what you're going to do when you get there because, you know, you don't know what happened. Tom Linehan arrived at 722 Elm Drive in the early hours of the morning. He met his regular partner, Detective Zola, outside the house. They filmed the horrors of what they saw. It's August 21st, 1989. Reported double homicide. Present at the scene are Detectives Zoller and Lenahan. We walked in through the front door. After walking through an entryway of the house is a family room, which is where the murder actually occurred. Linehan's 17 years as a policeman hadn't prepared him for what he was about to see. You can think of the goriest movie that you've ever seen. That is exactly what it was. It was a butcher shop. Blood, bone, and brain tissue were spattered all over the furniture, floor, and ceiling of the living room. Linehan was briefed by uniformed police officers already at the scene. The victims were Jose Menendez, a 45-year-old wealthy businessman, and his 48-year-old wife, Kitty. Their sons, Lyle and Eric, told police they had been out for the evening before coming home to find their parents dead. The killers had shot Jose five times, in his legs, in his arms, and at point-blank range in the back of his head. Kitty's body had been slumped on the floor at her husband's feet, one of her blood-stained shoes resting on the shelf of a coffee table. She had been even more mutilated than her husband. She received 11 shotgun wounds to the body, her face predominantly, and you couldn't even tell that, that it was a, who it was. I mean, you couldn't make an identification by, by uh, just looking at her. Beverly Hills was appalled by the killings. Six months later, all America was horrified when the dead couple's sons admitted to the murders. We just burst through the doors and uh, I started firing. Lyle Menendez was 21 years old. Eric was 18. When I walked in the room, I, I was panicking and I just fired every shot I had. I didn't stop to take a look at what I was doing after each shot. I just fired until there was nothing left. At their trial, Lyle and Eric Menendez admitted killing their parents. The question everybody asked was, why? What caused that kind of such deep, deep hatred of a man that you could walk up to him and open up his skull with a shotgun blast so that his brain falls out on the floor. I mean, that is serious, serious violence. The family is wondrously happy. Everybody is successful and in love with each other, appreciative and following the American dream. It's an idyllic story. The truth in this case 
is that this family was 180 degrees the other direction. The driving force of the family, Jose Menendez, had been born in the Cuban capital, Havana, in 1944. His middle-class family wasn't rich, but it held its place high in Cuban society. The Menendezes were competitive, many of them swimmers and athletes. The young Jose inherited the family love of sport and of winning at it. In 1959, the stability of the Menendez lives was overturned by the Cuban Revolution. Fidel Castro seized power and stripped the middle classes of their wealth. Thousands fled to the United States. One of them was 16-year-old Jose Menendez. Jose Menendez was the type of man that they write books about. He basically started out with nothing, a typical immigrant. He worked his way up, amassed a fine fortune, and did it all basically through hard work, through going to school, through the traditional path. At university, Jose met fellow student and ex-beauty queen Mary Anderson. Throughout her life, she was known as Kitty. Jose and Kitty fell in love, and despite opposition from both sets of parents, eloped and married. By his mid-twenties, Jose had transformed himself from penniless immigrant into troubleshooting financial wizard. People thought of him as a hard ass. He was really um, hard on the people that he, that he hired and hard on himself. And that is the Jose Menendez that people eventually met. He was a very strong man, very forceful man, very dynamic man. He was very driven. And these kinds of men sometimes make great leaders and they are, they are oftentimes very successful. They're not always the easiest people to live with, but they're always interesting. In 1968, Jose and Kitty's first son, Lyle, was born. Two years later, his brother, Eric, followed. But Jose's expectations of his sons were so high that they would never be fulfilled. He wanted two little Jose Juniors, and that wasn't what he got. He got a Lyle and he got an Eric. He considered Lyle to be a blow-off, not as hard a worker. He wanted to not have to do his schoolwork and still try to get A's. He wanted Daddy to come and fix things for him. Eric, Jose considered a crybaby. He wasn't as masculine as Jose. And no matter how well they did at certain things, it was never enough for Jose. Unless you were the workaholic badass that Jose Menendez was, you weren't enough for him. During the 1970s, the Menendez family lived in the Ivy League University town of Princeton, New Jersey, about 50 miles from New York City where Jose worked. They graduated to a home that reflected their wealth and status as Jose pushed his way to the top of every corporate ladder he stepped on. He took no prisoners. If you did not meet his deadlines and his expectations, he would fire you like that. He would take pleasure in denying you a Christmas bonus or vacation or whatever. He enjoyed humiliating people and, and uh, watching them suffer and grovel in front of him because he was a person that had so much power. And he was the same at home. He sat at the dinner table and had these quiz sessions where he would quiz his two boys on current events, historical events, and if they didn't know the answers, he would get very upset at them. The pressure was extremely high. This was not just a family sitting around the dinner table uh, having fun. If you didn't know the answer, you were in trouble. Jose Menendez had unlimited ambitions for his sons. 
They would go to the best universities, they would shine academically, and they would excel at sport. Jose hired a top coach to turn his sons into professional tennis players. Lyle was 10, Eric was 8. Nice. He controlled the whole situation in many ways. Rather than just come and observe the coaching that I was giving, he would come on court with a list of requirements that he wanted me to work on that day. And oftentimes he would actually go on the court and start giving instruction to Lyle himself. That's nice footwork. Lyle and Eric practiced Good. most Good days of the week, balance. arriving before school at six in the morning and going back in the evening for extra coaching. I think these boys were pushed more than any two kids I've ever seen. Go. Footwork first. One night Good. they were leaving at 10 o'clock and I made a joke. I said, Jose, you guys leaving so soon? I meant just the opposite. And he said, and he didn't smile and he said, yes, uh, Lyle has homework to do now, and he was 10 years old, so he was going to go home at 10 o'clock at night and do homework. I don't think there was a great balance in their life with other fun things to do, just growing up as young boys. I don't think they had those experiences. Jose Menendez had succeeded by hard work and sacrifice, and he was determined that his sons would follow his path. He wanted his sons to be like him, to emulate him. The way he had led his life had been so successful for him, he viewed this as like a blueprint for success. Lyle and Eric had to succeed at everything they did because they were Jose's sons and the inheritors of the Menendez genes. And he would go nose to nose with them, asking them, which is the best family in the world? And they were taught to say Menendez. They've been taught that they're genetically special and that they are in a world of their own and that they're entitled, they're privileged. They could break the rules. They could take advantage of other people and manipulate and control and mold things to achieve what they wanted. So, I mean, in, a, in an odd way, their father is teaching them aspects of thinking and behavior that are leading to his own death. On a hot August night in 1989, Lyle and Eric Menendez had shot their parents to death. But they hadn't told the police that. They said they'd spent the evening cruising around West Los Angeles in their car and watching a movie at a cinema. That just basically was a cover story for the fact that they had to be away from the place and they had to get rid of the guns and everything that could link them to the crime. They were doing what any criminal does after a crime, which is they were getting rid of the evidence. But what Lyle and Eric Menendez really did that evening was very different from the tale they told the police. After shooting their parents to death, the brothers covered up their crime. They showered and changed into clean clothes in the guest house at the end of the garden. They left the house to dump their guns and their blood-soaked clothing. And they returned hours after killing their parents to make their distressed call to the police. Homicide detective Tom Linehan was briefed about the mental state of Lyle and Eric on the night of the murders. The first policeman at the crime scene, uniformed patrol officers, had found the brothers in a frenzy of extreme emotion. They were ordering the occupants out of the house, which was Lyle and Eric, and they came running out of the house extremely despondent and carrying and crying and, and yelling and that kind of stuff. And, and Eric ran from from the doorway across the driveway to this tree and, and, and started trying to bash his head against the tree and he had to be physically restrained by the officers. Lyle and Eric had killed in cold blood, but their panic-stricken distress may have been genuine. After returning from dumping the guns, the brothers saw their parents' bodies again. 
The plan was working perfectly until they saw the horror of what they had done with their parents massacred. They are in shock. They are traumatized. So it's real when they say, somebody's killed our parents. The thing they're leaving out is it's, it's us, right? But all the emotion that's going along with this is, is genuine. As, as odd as it seems, it's real. They're in shock at what they have done. It's not that they're in shock of what somebody else has done. Lyle and Eric were questioned at Beverly Hills Police Station. When asked who they thought might have killed their parents, they answered, maybe the mob. But something else, the brothers said, threw suspicion back on them. Lyle and Eric claimed they had smelt gun smoke in the room on the night of the murder. When somebody discharges a firearm, obviously there's smoke just from the, from the bullets going off and the rounds firing. That dissipates very, very quickly. I mean, it, it's there for one minute and it's gone probably within maybe 10 or 15 seconds. And the only people that would smell that would be somebody that fired the guns. Ballistic analysis allowed the police to build up a picture of the murderers. The extreme violence and mayhem of the killings and the brother's story about smelling gun smoke meant that the picture was starting to resemble Lyle and Eric Menendez. Well, well this is five shots right here, and as you can see, if somebody got shot, they're not going to look the same. They're going to look like paper machete. You can see right in here all the little pellets that we have in my hand. Pretty damaging to somebody if they got shot with a hundred little BBs coming at them at over a thousand feet per second. The overkill in this case is similar to the overkill in many other cases of, for example, battered women they kill their husbands. They don't just shoot them once. They shoot them 20 times. The same is true in the cases of children that kill their parents. This is like a little powerless individual suddenly taking on this, this dramatic, gigantic persona. And so that in conjunction with all this reservoir of hate and, 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 and resentment and, and anger just explodes. Jose and Kitty had been blasted with shotgun pellets. Extreme overkill, amateur incompetence, or both. The rounds that were used to kill these people was not something you would use normally. You, you, you'd want to shoot as few rounds as you could to do what you had to do to get the heck out of there. So we felt that that was one of the reasons that you're dealing with somebody that was very close to the family. The amateurish nature of the killings now made Lyle and Eric the prime suspects. It wasn't mob hitmen. And there was one more thing. Jose and Kitty's death had handed the brothers a $4 million inheritance. But the police still had no hard evidence on them they put the Elm Drive mansion under surveillance and started to monitor Lyle and Eric's movements. After the murders, the brothers were free to carry on their lives as normal, but what they chose to do with their lives soon attracted attention. Well, it got to be kind of bizarre in the fact that probably a week after the murders, maybe five days after the murders, we started to notice an inordinate amount of charges. Lyle and Eric got busy in the more expensive shopping areas of West Los Angeles. They spent wildly using their father's company credit card and the proceeds of an insurance policy that had paid out on Jose's death. The boys went to a mall next to Beverly Hills 
and bought five Rolex watches, expensive Armani suits, and that sort of thing, which they said they needed for the uh, uh, funeral, which is probably true, but you don't need five Rolex watches. Luxury apartments, new cars, and lavish parties followed. Within a few months, the grieving brothers had spent close to a million dollars. Jose and Kitty Menendez were buried eight days after their murders. Their bodies were flown nearly 3,000 miles back to Princeton, where they lie side by side in a quiet corner of the public cemetery. Now that Jose was buried, Lyle decided to become a tycoon himself, just like his father had been. Lyle, I think, was the more aggressive of the two brothers. He was most like his father. When he was going to his father's funeral, he remarked to someone in the car, uh, look how well I fill my father's shoes. Um, so he, um, I think, uh, crafted himself on Jose's personality and was determined to be Jose and more. Clearly, he had major feelings of inadequacy when it came to his father. We were talking to psychologists about the the belief that he almost had to kill his father to be his father. He would never be the man his father wanted him to be while his father lived. Lyle bought a restaurant near Princeton University where he was a student. Chuck's Cafe had made a good profit for years. Under Lyle's new management, it made its first loss. Lyle Menendez wanted to be a tycoon, but he didn't seem to grasp that if you want to make a successful business, like a successful restaurant, you have to work at it. His idea was like what you see on television, a soap opera where all of them are pretty people with wonderful jobs, but they never seem to work. That's how he viewed reality, and that isn't reality. In 1986, the Menendez family had been living in Calabasas, a small, wealthy town in California, just outside Los Angeles. Here, two years before the murders, Lyle and Eric had made a previous stab at creating wealth without work. They were going to Eric's friends' homes when their families were on vacation, and they were doing burglaries of their homes. And they weren't doing just breaking into homes and taking, you know, money or watches or stuff like that. They were cleaning the houses out. By the time they were caught, the brothers had stolen around $100,000 worth of goods. Jose Menendez got them out of trouble, as he was able to do so well. Uh, he, he got a deal with the authorities so that they wouldn't have to do any jail time or anything like that. And, but what came of that is they had to get counseling a psychologist was appointed to counsel Lyle and Eric. He was Dr. Jerome Ozeal. His was a name that the brothers would never forget. The scandal of the Calabasas burglaries forced Jose and Kitty to move. In 1988, they bought 722 Elm Drive. They had just a year left to enjoy it. The tensions in the family that had been festering over the years came to a head in the Beverly Hills mansion. Eric and Lyle knew that their life with their father was going to be a never-ending struggle to satisfy him. And it was that uh, oppressive experience that they felt uh, that stemmed from him I think that led to their anger and frustration, which they reflected back toward him. And it was a spiraling sense of frustration and anger within the household. The turmoil included Kitty. Lyle and Eric were isolated from both their parents. Their mother, instead of intervening and uh, trying to be a buffer between father and the children, 
always seemed to take father's side and, and he had complete control over her. And if she piped up and said anything, he would just say, Kitty? And she would melt. The mother did not do much to protect them. She was suffering from uh, being the victim of an extramarital affair. Jose Menendez was cheating on her. She wasn't um, there for them as much as she could have been. There was just this turmoil swirling about constantly inside the walls of what seemed to be the American dream. Lyle and Eric reacted very differently to the problems in the family. Their characters were poles apart. Eric is a far more vulnerable person in terms of his personality than Lyle. Uh, throughout the investigation, I always felt as though Lyle was the dominant actor, and Eric was essentially following in his shadow. It's not to say that Eric didn't know what he was doing. He knew essentially what he was doing, and if anything, he was trying to emulate and make himself loved, cared for by Lyle. We felt that Eric was going to be the weak link in this whole thing. He seemed to be the one that was the most upset by the death. He was the one that, that uh, was most hurt, and he was actually the one that, that, that seemed truly touched by the death of the parents. We felt that at some point, Eric would be so remorseful for what he did that he would have to tell somebody. Two months after the murders, Tom Lenahan drove back to the Elm Drive mansion. He was looking for a chance to play on Eric's weaker character. He was in luck. Lyle wasn't there. Linehan interviewed the younger brother alone. Eric was so calm during the interview, but you knew that he had to be dying on the inside, knowing that the police were on to him. When you give them a little taste that we might know something they're not telling us, it's, it's, it's got to be frightening for him. And I think in this particular case, it was. Eric was shaken and desperately needed someone to talk to. He made an appointment to see his counselor, Dr. Ozeal. Eric clearly had major guilt problems with these murders and had to get it off his chest and had to tell someone and who best to tell but your psychiatrist. Dr. Ozeal had counseled the brothers since the Calabasas burglaries. Eric often confided in him. Now, Ozeal suggested they went for a walk. Eric, at this point, was at his wit's ends. Ozeal felt that he needed an environment that would make him comfortable so that Eric would be able to be, feel very free in being able to express what was going on for such a long time in his own mind. So Ozeal figured that a walk around the block might be helpful. And this was the block that he picked. And when they had finally come full circle to Ozeal's office, Eric made the full confession. On the doorstep of Dr. Ozeal's office, Eric Menendez finally admitted that he and Lyle had killed their parents. But Eric's murder confession was subject to doctor-patient confidentiality. The police couldn't know. Dr. Ozeal called Lyle to his office to tell him about Eric's confession. Lyle ultimately went ballistic, absolutely out of his mind, horrifically challenging Eric for what he had done and berating him and telling him that now uh, it would may, it may be necessary to kill virtually everybody that might come in contact with the case or might become aware of the confession that Eric had just disclosed to Ozeal. And of course, that also meant having to kill Ozeal. But Dr. Ozeal, in fear of his life, convinced the brothers that far from being a threat to them, he could be their savior. He told Lyle that, that you know what, I could build you guys up a defense uh, based around uh, you guys being sociopaths and the fact that you were having problems with your family. And I, I could build up a defense, so this is a good thing that you're telling me, because if something does happen, I can be your best ally to help you get off. Dr. Ozeal convinced both brothers to talk to him openly about the murders. 
But Lenehan and his colleagues still knew nothing about their confessions. The case was at a standstill. Then, out of the blue, a woman, Judalyn Smith, rang the police. Judalyn Smith was Dr. Ozeal's lover, and they had fallen out. She knew everything, and she blew the case wide open. Judalyn overheard what happened. I mean, she heard a a blow-by-blow -blow, uh, description as to what happened on the murders, uh, how it happened, what happened to the guns, where they bought the guns, the whole step-by-step -step process of the murder of, of Kitty and Jose. Judalyn Smith told the police that to buy the guns, Lyle and Eric had made the two-hour journey south to San Diego. Linehan and his partner did the same. The big five store in the city still had the purchase order for two shotguns, sold two days before the murders. They had been bought with a forged signature of one of Lyle's Princeton friends. Judalyn Smith also told the police that the brothers had dumped the guns into a canyon a few miles north of Beverly Hills. Linehan went looking for them but he was out of luck. It's a very desolate area with canyons and hillsides that are pretty impenetrable. We've never ever recovered the shotguns. I don't anticipate we'll ever find them. If we do, it'll be a fluke and maybe it's a hiker or somebody just walking these canyons. But the disappearance of the guns didn't really matter because Judalyn Smith had one more revelation. Her lover, Dr. Ozeal, had the confessions of the Menendez brothers on tape. The recorded confessions could now be used as evidence. Because Lyle had threatened Dr. Ozeal's life, he was no longer protected by doctor-patient confidentiality. The police seized the tapes from Dr. Ozeal and prepared to arrest Lyle and Eric Menendez for killing their parents. In March 1990, the police seized taped confessions by Eric and Lyle Menendez to the murder of their parents. Immediately, they ordered the brothers' arrest. Eric was out of the country, but Lyle was at the Elm Drive mansion, about to go out to lunch with friends. Lyle now, along with his two friends, comes out of his driveway in his Jeep and casually drives down the, toward the end of the block. And as he's approaching the end of the block, there's a blue car that is sitting there waiting for him to arrive. Lights are flashing. Lyle sees that and panic has to strike him down to his bones. Lyle makes a desperate attempt to try to get away, even backing into the car that's behind him, another police car. And when they're all ordered to face down on the street in a felony position, Lyle complies, realizing I probably at that point that this is the last day of freedom he will ever see. Eric was playing in a tennis tournament in Israel. Mark Heffernan, his coach and sports psychologist, was with him when Eric heard of his brother's arrest and learned that he was threatened with extradition. Eric panicked. He was really, really agitated. And I had to settle him down and organize him. We, had to be out, we were literally out of Israel in one hour. He was panicked that whole time back. I tried to counsel him and I said, all of the things that we've talked about in performance enhancement and sports psychology, you can use in pr prison to help keep you sane there and he was too distraught to, to take that in. Eric gave himself up to police at Los Angeles International Airport. After six months of freedom, Lyle and Eric Menendez awaited trial for first-degree murder. It took another three and a half years of legal wrangling before the trial took place. But when the trial finally began, it fascinated the world with every detail and revelation. 
we fired many, many times, and uh, there were just glass, and you could hear things breaking, and you could hear the ringing noises from the booms, and there was the smoke from the guns, and uh, it was basically just chaos. What happened in between when I first started firing, when I when I ended, is is it's just a red uh, blank to me. And what did you do after you reloaded? I ran around and shot my mom. After Lyle and Eric's admissions to killing their parents, a guilty verdict had seemed a formality. But despite the brothers' confessions, their lawyers had a defense strategy. Lyle and Eric Menendez pleaded not guilty to first-degree murder. Eric's lawyer, Leslie Abramson, argued the brothers had killed in self-defense. Controversially, she claimed they had suffered years of physical and sexual abuse. Eric Menendez was the abused son of wealthy parents. He killed his parents because he could no longer endure their abuse and had to stop it. Abramson drew intimate details from the brothers of the abuse they said had been inflicted on them, mostly by their father. He would guide me on my movements and I would um, uh, have oral sex with him. Did you want to do this? From the very start, Leslie Abramson had presented these young men as vulnerable young boys. Leslie Abramson was very successful and my hat's off to her. She basically created an alternate universe involving these defendants and, real and the reality of their lives and the reality of this murder. She took two grown men and created the illusion that they were these almost pipsqueaks. She dressed them in a manner that would convey that they were just, you know, young little fellows and she mothered them in such a way. You'd think you were with two 14-year-old boys. And in fact, these were two grown men who could have been fathers themselves. For months during the trial, Leslie Abramson relentlessly piled up detail after detail of sexual abuse that she alleged Jose Menendez had inflicted on his sons. You heard about some of the things that he liked to do to his little boy. And one of them was to stick tacks like this in his thighs and in his butt. Forensic psychiatrist Dr. William Vickery treated Eric Menendez throughout his arrest and trial. A key defense witness, he testified in vivid detail that he believed that Eric was sexually abused by his father. He was struggling with this fact that he had been sexually molested by his father, and he, he was very ashamed about that and conflicted. If Jose wanted to go up to the son's bedroom and sodomize him whenever he felt like it, he insisted that this was his castle, that he was in control, and nobody could stop him, nobody. And he made it perfectly clear that if anybody stood in his way, he would squash him like a bug. Vickery believes that on the night of the murder, Jose was about to abuse Eric again, and that Lyle was trying to protect his younger brother. He turned to Eric and he says, Eric, go up to your room. I'll be up later. And everybody knew what that meant. So Lyle stepped forward and he said, no. And there was kind of a standoff. At which point, the father looked them both in the eye and he said, this is my house and you will do what I say, or else. 
Jose and Kitty went into the television room and shut the doors. According to the defense, the brothers feared that their parents were plotting against them. They thought, are they getting ready to kill us? So at that point, they both say that they were freaked out and scared out of their minds. They ran out to their car, loaded the shotguns, and ran back inside the house, throwing open the doors, and shot both their parents to death. The defense argument that the abused brothers had killed their parents in a frenzy of panic and fear convinced some, but was scorned by many. I have real difficulty believing that they were abused in this whole scenario, because to accept it would mean that to accept that they were being abused as basically adults. Big, strong, strapping boys, no other way to put it. If they were really, really being brutalized and sodomized by their father as adults, there were so many options for them. You could join the military. You could join the Army, the Navy, the Air Force. You could go to college. But whether Lyle and Eric had been abused or not, Leslie Abramson swung the trial from the prosecution's course onto her own. The problem was the prosecutors believed that this was a slam dunk. They had the confession. What else did they need? They went in with a three-week case. They took three weeks to put on their slam dunk evidence and then they sat down and the defense stood up and took six months. Six months to explain away this murder to the point where you forgot that the victims in the case were Kitty and Jose Menendez, to the point where people thought the victims were Lyle and Eric Menendez. The jury and alternates are in the courtroom. Leslie Abramson pulled off a legal miracle. Despite the fact that the brothers had confessed to murdering their parents, a hung jury found it impossible to agree on their guilt. Since our last report to you, we have been unable to move closer to agreement on any of the counts. Lyle and Eric Menendez had escaped conviction for murder. But there was a retrial and a tough new prosecution team. David Kahn and Carol Nahada. I think that we have now seen the defense take their best shot. We know exactly where they're going. There are no more surprises. So we are not going to be taken by surprise, and I think we're going to have the clear advantage in the retrial. We're both eager to start this case and bring it to some kind of a conclusion. The second trial ended in March 1996, almost seven years after the killings. Lyle and Eric Menendez were each found guilty of first-degree murder. And in a legal system where the jury decides the sentence, Lyle, the ringleader, escaped the death penalty just by chance. The four women had a heart attack and another juror went into premature labor. They had to replace those two jurors. One of the guys who was a replacement juror ended up convincing the rest of the jury to give Lyle life instead of death. And had that woman not had a heart attack the night before, he would be on death row right now. Lyle and Eric Menendez were each sentenced to life imprisonment without possibility of parole. But they might just have got away with it if it hadn't been for Eric. In terms of hard evidence that was presented to me, quite frankly, without him talking to Dr. Ozeal, I'm not sure this case would have ever been solved. Lyle had the kind of mind where he could do this and walk away and go on and live his life and spend all his father's money and get away with it. It would have been the perfect murder if Lyle hadn't involved Eric. But Eric was his conscience, and that's how they got found out. Lyle is now 37, Eric 35. The brothers have served nine years of their sentences in separate California jails, 200 miles apart. Almost certainly, they will never see each other again. <laughs>